So in this video, I want to discuss the topic of the frequency of defensive gun uses. Uh, this is a really important topic whenever we get into utilitarian arguments about gun control. Uh, the logic of gun controllers or anti-gun people uh, is pretty straightforward here. Uh, they look at the general society and they say, uh, look at all the people who die in gun violence, who die from gun suicides, who die from gun homicides uh, and accidents. And that's all really negative, uh, as indeed it is. And then look at the positive side, and they don't come up with anything that's even qualitatively similar. So um, while they'll acknowledge that perhaps people use guns for hunting, and perhaps people use guns for sport, like sport shooting, and perhaps sometimes they have a place in agriculture and in pest control, um, that all those things, however valuable they might be, they just simply are incomparably less valuable than human life. All right, if you're using a, a 22 to hunt gophers or kill uh, muskrats or rats or, or or birds, or if you're hunting, I mean, a lot of people who are anti-gun, there's going to be a correlation. They're just not going to like hunting either. But even if they even if they think hunting's good, you know, and even if they acknowledge, well, maybe it's a big industry and maybe it's enjoyable and whatnot. It doesn't compare to murders, you know, and mass murders. Um, and so the logic seems pretty straightforward that, you know, these benefits uh, are completely um, obliterated by the costs. And the objection then is that while the value of guns is not limited to things like agriculture uh, and uh, recreation, whether it be for hunting or for target shooting. Now, I do think that a lot of gun control people really do underestimate how valuable those things by themselves are. Hunting is hugely popular and hugely important for a lot of the country. It's hugely valuable and um, in terms of pest control guns really are quite effective in certain situations. Obviously not for everything and not all the time. Um, but the retort is, well what about people who use guns in self-defense? Uh, sometimes from animals but much more frequently and much more importantly from humans. Uh, and to this the gun controllers find themselves in a position of having to minimize that number of people as much as possible. So it opens up the question of well, how often do people use guns in self-defense from especially other people, although we could hypothetically include animals here. Um, and this is actually quite tricky. Uh, we know it happens. We have videos of it happen, you, happening. You can go on YouTube right now and spend the rest of your day and the rest of the day tomorrow and the rest of the week looking at videos of uh, people using guns in self-defense in what turn out to be legitimate cases. And also sometimes in cases that turn out to be not legitimate. Um, there are also cases that we don't have video of, but we know happen. They get reported. They're in the news sometimes. Uh, rarely makes national news, but the reports are there if you want to search. Uh, but these are, at best, extremely minimal numbers because we know, uh, just logically, I mean, uh, that the large majority of uh, defensive gun uses are not certainly not recorded on video, and even if they are, the chance that you find them on your platform that you are watching is pretty low. So uh, even if a certain event is recorded by a camera, say a, um, a security camera, it doesn't mean that video is going to end up on YouTube or that you are going to find it and then be swayed by the mountain mountain of evidence of all these videos that you've seen. Um, but then many of these events are just not going to have videos or those videos are never going to be uploaded or known about. Um, criminals who uh, are thwarted or scared away by um, a defensive gun use are certainly not going to go report it to the local authorities or the local a criminological a statistic, stat, statistician to say, oh, you know, just by the way, I was trying to commit an armed robbery and, you know, my victim pulled out a gun and I ran away and I just wanted you to know that so that you could uh, have more accurate data in your studies. That certainly is never going to happen. And actually, it's probably unlikely that the, uh, the potential victim or the defensive gun user would do the same. There's very little incentive to do this. Uh, the chances that the police are then going to go and apprehend the suspect are quite low. Uh, at, and I think the large majority of people are realistic enough to understand that. There's a chance that um, that you're just going to be hassled with going to the, the police and having to fill out the paperwork and going through all this all for no benefit. And there's the added problem that you might actually get uh, criminally charged yourself. Sometimes because you may have technically broken the law and sometimes just because you live in a really anti-gun area that likes to clamp down on people who commit crimes like this. These 
Um, yeah, and this the, this varies a lot in different localities. There's certainly parts of the of the United States where you can use a gun defensively, and as long as you haven't really abused it, you're not going to get uh, in any trouble. And there's other places where you're going to be scrutinized enormously and and placed uh, under great legal scrutiny. Uh, and so there's very little incentive for you to do it. So there isn't, uh, you know, the, the same way that we can collect data on, say, homicides or, or armed robberies, we, there just isn't it's going to be as good data on, on this as, as those other things. The other thing is a defensive gun use uh, prevents a crime from happening. So you're trying to count something that didn't happen. It's like trying to count the number of heart attacks that didn't happen because people ate healthy or because they went to the gym. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we, we don't know exactly how many there are, and of course we don't know the breakdown of, well, people used a gun defensively, how many of the people uh, were, saved their life or just prevented themselves from being raped or presented, prevented themselves or someone else from being robbed. Um, obviously not everyone who uses a gun defensively is stopping a homicide, but obviously some of them are, and we don't really know exactly. So uh, this is a question that is really, really important because if the number of... Uh, people who are used to gu use guns defensively is minuscule or very tiny relative to the number of people who uh, uh, are murdered by guns every year or who commit crimes with guns every year, then, you know, there might be a utilitarian argument there. I don't think necessarily a persuasive one. There's other questions involving uh, defense against tyranny and uh, the other um, deterrent effects that I've listed before in other videos, but, uh, you know, it would be a valid point to make. On the other hand, if defensive gun uses are fairly common relative uh, to the number of uh, assaults committed with guns or offensive gun, gun uses, then it's hard to see how uh, restricting them to the general populace would have any kind of net benefit. Uh, so, this story can't really be talked about without addressing Gary Kleck. Gary Kleck is a criminologist from the University of Florida. Uh, he's a fairly well-respected criminologist per a standard uh, um, professorial uh, professor, not particularly ideological. If you read his books, he doesn't come across as having any kind of strong um, love or favor one way or the other. He's just somebody who wanted to look at the data and he realized that they just didn't have any. So um, in 1993 he composed a survey which he refers to as the National Self-Defense Survey and for those of you who are interested I'm referring from this book Armed, Gary Kleck and Don Cates and by the way Don Cates is something of an old leftist, an old liberal civil rights activist. Uh, I was kind of pleasantly surprised to see him co this. I've seen him speak about gun rights in uh, a couple documentaries. I didn't realize that he'd co-authored this, uh, co this book rather with Kleck. Uh, this book was written, I believe, in uh, mid-2000s, uh, as in mid-2000, not mid-2000s. Um, uh, so it is somewhat dated. And I'll do another review uh, about the book because it brings up a lot of other interesting topics that actually even I had never even really thought about or read about. Um, uh, but for this video, I just want to talk about um, defensive, self-defensive gun uses. Uh, so he devised a survey, which he terms the National Self-Defense Survey. Uh, he claims it's the first survey of its kind. There were polls that were done by various news agencies before then, but this was a, a survey where they would go county by county, calling people, interviewing people. Uh, and, you know, in the course of these interviews, these were done again in 93, so these numbers are probably not correct any longer just because violent crime has gone down quite a lot since then. Um, started coming up with numbers in the low millions, one to two million defensive gun years, uses per year. Uh, and there have been uh, numerous other studies, numerous, uh, in a, a couple dozen anyway, uh, that have actually come to very similar estimates. Now, these are very large estimates. Uh, when we consider how many people are killed by guns every year, it seems like what? There's a million self-defense gun uses? Seems like a lot. But uh, what we know from the surveys and what makes sense uh, is that the vast majority of self-defense gun uses don't involve a fatality uh, of anyone. People brandish a gun or even don't even brandish it, but simply say, I have a gun or make a noise with a gun. And uh, most assailants are going to leave at that point. Um, there's always this... Uh, kind of hypothetical, what if you shouldn't use a gun because the assailant is just going to escalate 
and a shootout's going to happen, and no doubt you're going to kill a whole bunch of kids on a playground. Uh, that is, of course, not theoretically impossible. Uh, but the nature of most crimes and the nature of most armed crimes is not one of escalation. Criminals are not looking to get into a firefight if they're trying to rob you or take others, get any kind of material benefit, whatever, which is the proximate uh, motivation for every crime. Uh, even if you might want to look for deeper so, uh, psychological reasons why it happens, uh, that's the proximate reason, and none of those benefits are worth risking death which is what you are risking if you get into an armed conflict with somebody. It doesn't matter if you are yourself armed. You get in a gunfight with somebody else, you could die. The fact that you have a gun doesn't mean that you can't be killed. Uh, and the wallet that you wanted to steal, the sneakers that you wanted to steal, steal, the aggravated assault is irrelevant at that point. Now, are, are there some who would still escalate? Sure, but this is such a tiny minority, it makes no sense to, uh, you know, uh, treat that as the normative case. It's certainly not. Um, so, and and this is anecdotally. I mean, when you interview people, uh, you don't find that and you don't find that many people who have killed an assailant, but mainly mainly who have brandished a gun and threatened it. And um, which is interesting because brandishing is is technically a crime in a lot of places. So if you pull out a gun and say get get out of here. You know, you may have prevented a crime, but you may have also caused a crime, which is why it's probably underreported. You would not then go to the police and say, hey, I waved a gun at somebody to chase them away. Um, actually, you had a friend who did that uh, because he was drunk and he got arrested and went to jail and got in serious trouble for it. And in his case, maybe deservedly so. Um, so you don't want to, you don't want to, uh, this is this is one of the, um, if, if we look at like the, uh, You'll see a lot of statistics saying stuff like the chances that you uh, use a gun to defend yourself are, are X teen times lower than the chances that you'll be killed by a gun. Um, like the Kellerman study is the most famous study of this. And the, kind of the, the fly in the ointment there is that they, they only measure defensive gun uses by defensive gun homicides. So they only count uh, when the assailant is killed. So if you shoot an assailant but he doesn't die, then that does not count as a defensive gun use. If you wave, if you shoot a warning shot and a, and a and a assailant runs away, that does not count as a defensive gun use. If you wave or just brandish a weapon and chase away an assailant, uh, that also does not count as a defensive gun use. You have to kill someone and then they'll count it as a defensive gun use. And the and then say, well, you know, there's only a few hundred. And I think the FBI does actually track track justifiable homicides. And I think in any given year, you're talking about a few hundred, two hundred, three hundred, something like that. A relatively small number and they said oh so there's only two or three hundred defensive gun uses per year in the United States no because that is a tiny tiny sliver uh, of defensive gun uses the vast majority involve the weapon not being fired at all most of the rounds that are fired don't hit anybody and most of the hits don't result in fatalities uh, so you're looking at the smallest subset of the smallest subset of the smallest subset and then saying oh look see this is pretty rare yeah of course you you could, you could make it even more rare and say we're only going to count defensive gun uses if you shoot the assailant in the left shoulder. And if you shoot him in the right shoulder, well, no, that doesn't count for whatever reason. Um, so uh, but one thing, another really important thing here. So Clack has done his study. Um, I'll look for a link before I post it. But uh, it appears that uh, after this was done, the CDC did a study in response and basically their estimate of defensive gun uses were slightly higher and they buried the study and didn't publicize it and it just only within the last year got discovered that they had done this research that basically uh, concurred with Kleck. Now, uh, in the course of debating this um, with people, which is something that you know I've been uh, want to do for many years now, um, sometimes I'll, you'll hear reference to a different estimate. Um, because even people in the Brady campaign, no, no, nobody can say that this never happens, right? We have a evidence, direct evidence of it happening sometimes. So when gun controllers have to produce an estimate, they like to use an estimate that was provided by the uh, National Crime Victimization Survey results. Uh, now, the National Crime Victimization Survey was a very large, very complex, very sophisticated study of crime that was committed in the United States. How many rapes, how many murders, burglary big study. It was not a study of defensive gun uses. Uh, uh, the, su the survey was committed by the, I think it was the Department of Justice. It's definitely a federal agency. Uh, let me see if I can check it right here. 
don't see it right off the bat, but in any event, uh, so the numbers that they reached uh, were 50 to 70,000, which was the only estimate. All other estimates were over 700,000, so more than a more than a, a, a an entire factor uh, larger, order of magnitude larger uh, than the study. But this is the study then that all pro gun control people were cite, and I've had lengthy debates with people where they'll just say this has got to be that this has got to be it this is the this and they'll say well it's the biggest study and and whatnot well it wasn't a study of self-defense of gun uses it was a study of crime and it's, it's, in terms of study of of crime it's not bad i'm not going to criticize it for that but it didn't set out to be a study of defensive gun uses there's a couple problems with it as a survey as far as i got the first is that it was not anonymous if you call someone and say where were the government and we're going to ask you about potential crimes you've committed with the use of a gun, people are not going to are, are less likely to answer, honestly. Some people still will and some people won't. Um, but if you're asking somebody to admit to what could be considered a crime or at least get the attention of the government, a lot of people are not going to answer, honestly. But it's even worse than that because the National uh, Victimization Survey didn't ask people if they used a gun in self-defense. It would ask people if they'd been a victim of a crime. And then it would ask, did you do anything about it? And they could say yes or no. And of course, they could lie about that. But that was it. There was no prompting after that. Now, if the responder added on their own, on their own initiative, well, I used a gun, well, then they would chop that down. And this is where this extremely null number comes up. But it would be very much akin to saying, well, only one-tenth of one percent of Americans ever go to Europe on vacation because they did a survey where they asked, did you go on vacation? And people said yes, and then added on their own that they went to Europe, you would write that down. But they didn't actually ask, did you ever go to Europe? They didn't actually ask people if they'd used a gun in self-defense. They said, did you do anything about getting attacked or being a victim of a crime? By which you could, calling the police would count as something, calling a friend would count as something, running away would count as something, using a gun in self-defense would count as something. And then, you would have to unprompted add, I used a gun in self-defense. So this is, you know, the study is fine for victims of crime uh, because that's what it was trying to study. It was not trying to study defensive gun uses. So its results are obviously uh, underrepresentative by like at least one order of magnitude, maybe more. Um, but tell that to the, the gun. And, and it's interesting too, because 70 to... Uh, Fifty to seventy thousand self-defense gun uses is still a lot. Like e even a even a small fraction of those, um, even if, if twenty percent of those resulted in, in in preventing a homicide, then the number of homicides prevented by guns would equal the number of homicides committed with guns because the number of homicides is around eleven thousand. Uh, now that that would be a high proportion, twenty percent preventing homicides, but it just shows that even that number is not inconsequential. That's a lot. Um, it just also happens to probably be at least 10 times less than it actually is. Uh, so, you, you know, big, a big motivation with this video, video was just ha debating people who insisted, you know, and these, the, look, your average gun controller has never heard of these studies. They don't know about them. They've never, they've certainly never gone to the trouble to read a book uh, about it. You can say what you want about CLEC, but I challenge you to find the book by uh, another criminologist uh, covering just this single topic, you might have a book about gun control that has one paragraph or one chapter that tries to dismiss Cleck and say he's, uh, you know, and now it would not just be Cleck, they'd have to be dismissing the CDC apparently as well, and the, every other study that's been done since then. Uh, but, you know, people want confirmation bias. They believe that guns are bad. They believe that people don't use them in self-defense, although there's no logical reason why that wouldn't be in the United States where we have roughly one-to-one -one ratio of humans to guns. People have them, people have access to them. There's a decent amount of crime in the United States. It seems actually quite unlikely that they wouldn't be used in self-defense. Like, like, what's the situation here? I have guns. If somebody tried to attack me and I had access to my guns, of course I would use them in self-defense. Now that's not statistically likely one-on-one -on -one for my particular case, but if you look at the millions, the tens of millions of gun owners, yeah, it's not that hard to believe that a couple hundred thousand, maybe a million a year could could take place, um, maybe more even, in, in certain areas. Uh, and yet, as soon as you start to admit that, the utilitarian case for gun control really kind of loses its last leg and falls to pieces. 
Uh, so there's this insistence on we got to find we can't say it's zero. Although I've had people say it never happens. I mean, you'll in in casual debates, people will say no, people never use guns in self-defense. And then you post picture videos of it happening or news articles about it happening, including in people stopping mass shootings. Right? We have examples of people stopping mass shootings with guns, uh, and then those people never get lionized by the media like child victims of other mass shootings. But that's a whole other topic. Um, and I mean, obviously, in, a, in an online debate, you know, there's no good, there's, there's no good faith, and so people will sometimes ignore even that. But they'll, they'll be like, well, yes, it does happen, but it must be so, it must be so rare. And then they can point. This is a big study. The National Criminaliz Criminals uh, Victims Criminalization is a big study. It's done by the government. It was sophisticated. It was groundbreaking. It just wasn't studying defensive gun uses, but it gives you this relatively small, I mean, 50 to 70,000, I don't, that doesn't sound like a small number on a human scale. Obviously, for the entire United States, it is small. Uh, but that's not what they were studying, and there's huge problems. Like, again, they, they never actually even asked people if they used guns in self-defense. They just said, did you do anything about your crime victimization? And then, you know, waited to see if, and, and, and survey, you don't, you don't wait for unprompted responses um, if you're looking for specific information, right? If you don't, you don't, if you're looking, if you're doing a survey of how many people have, um, uh, mono, you don't ask, did you get sick in the last year? And then hope that they volunteer. Yes, I had chicken pox or yes, I had measles or yes, I had mono. Oh, okay. One had mono. No, you ask them, did you have mono or not? Uh, <laughs> you know, you ask them if they, uh, leaving aside and, and he goes in great depth about, cause I was, I, I had questions about the survey. How do you know for sure? And you can't know for sure, but they would interview these people. Everyone who said that they had, they interviewed them repeatedly, looked for uh, holes in their story, looked for consistency. Um, they had uh, professional surveyors who this this is a job, uh, and they actually said, if anything, there's probably underreporting here. The, the 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 impulse to cover up having used a gun was probably stronger than the impulse to use braggadocio to, you know, uh, oh, yes, I used a gun because this is going to sound good when the NRA reports about it. No, uh, that seems like a very unlikely, it's not, again, not impossible, but a very unlikely motivation relative to the motivation to cover up potential use of a, a, of, of a defensive gun use. So uh, defensive gun uses are probably comparably common to all offensive gun uses. So I'm not just talking about homicides, I'm talking about aggravated assault, burglaries, uh, all of that. The numbers are similar. There might actually be more defensive gun uses. Uh, and contrary to the rhetoric, it's almost never lethal. You're simply brandishing, and the fact that you have the ability to escalate is enough to de-escalate the situation. That maybe sounds counterintuitive to a lot of people, um, but for your average criminal and even your extraordinary criminal, like uh, there's evidence that a lot of these mass shooters, um, they crumple as soon as there's any resistance. They don't want there to be resistance. That's why they're going to a school where guns are banned. They want to go to a place where they're not going to be thwarted by somebody else. So they don't go to gun shows. They don't go to big public malls or stuff like it's, it's kind of unusual. It's not unheard of, but it's kind of unusual to go to a place where you can expect resistance. And when they get resistance, they don't you know, uh, become Rambo, they either get killed or they stop. There's a lot of these uh, mass shooters actually give up, and regular criminals are just going to run away. They're, they're not that invested in the crime. It's, they're not going um, on on a, on a spree of exciting, you know, adventure. Uh, they, they want money, they want whatever, and they don't want to die in the process, so they, they leave. And uh, surveys of felons uh, reveal this. There's some great interviews John Stossel did with felons who says, look, look, if you don't know if someone has a gun, it's a huge problem. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, the attacks on Kleck are all in bad faith. Uh, some of the premier criminologists in the English speaking world, you know, said they disagree with him politically, but that his surveys are, you know, perfectly legitimate uh, and perfectly accurate. Um, He's revised these numbers some. I think these numbers are lower now just because crime has gone down in the United States since 93. He's doing these surveys kind of right at the peak, and crime has gone down 40, 50% since then, depending on the category. So, you know, we might be looking at a couple hundred thousand at this point, or maybe a million. Um, 
you know, uh, deterrent effects, he actually talks about that. Deterrent effects are almost impossible to measure. Uh, we don't know to what extent criminals don't commit crimes because they think there's a likelihood that victims will have a gun. Uh, that's a perfectly logical uh, inference to make, but probably one that we can't really measure. Uh, it would certainly be very difficult, so he doesn't really go into that, that other than to say how difficult that would be. Um, but yes, uh, given how many guns there are and how many people there are and how many crimes there are, it's absolutely ridiculous to assume tiny numbers of defensive gun uses. Um, and it's uh, equally uh, intellectually disingenuous to grasp at the uh, the most minimal study, like this is an outlier, all the studies, if all the studies are clustered here and you have one study that's way down here, I mean, you could make the argument, maybe that's really is the best study, but it was not a study of defensive gun uses, right? There's no, there's no question that it was an inferior study in terms of the methodology of what it's trying to measure. If we're talking about defensive gun uses, it wasn't even trying to measure that. So, um, it's a good book. I do actually want to talk about this book more in a different video because it's a pretty good book and brought up some points that I hadn't, um, and not directly related to this, but are still interesting. So anyone who is interested, Armed by Gary Kleck and Don Cates, definitely worth checking out. Uh, if you're curious about how often guns are used in self-defense, this is not the end of this issue. I'm going to read more about it, uh, but I did want to get this video out there. So anyway, I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.